important to mention that all the microphones are actually muted. And uh, in case you want them to ask questions, uh, there will be a question and answer session uh, in the second part of the meeting. And then you can either write your questions on the chat or you can also raise your hand and then we will unmute your microphone. Um, there will be a few presentations after the uh, the introduction the introductions and then there will be the question and answer session we aim to stay into one hour for the uh, for the meeting and uh, now i'm very uh, pleased to leave the floor to paula benea uh, to uh, give uh, a few introductory uh, words paula the floor is yours thank you daniele um, good afternoon all, good morning uh, to those uh, joining us from the other side of the world. Um, I'm glad to open today's meeting to that we we'll present to you a mechanism that we designed to support the engagement of diaspora organizations in the humanitarian context with a focus on the countries where diaspora is based. The model was drawn from the initiative that our mission has been carrying out with the Ukrainian diaspora in Italy since March 2022 to support its efforts in providing humanitarian assistance to war affected population in Ukraine and aid to displaced Ukrainians who have been arriving to Italy. Uh, we all know that well-engaged diasporas may help governments and communities resolve a crisis, deal with its humanitarian consequences and, to, and contribute to post-crisis recovery and rehabilitation. Thanks to their links with countries of origin and crisis-affected populations, diaspora organizations are indeed able to access difficult areas, have a closer view of the needs, and carry out targeted actions. Members of the diasporas are often the first responders and the first to take investment risks and have the potential to re reinvigorate and fuel more enduring social and economic development after the crisis. In different crises, both men and natural made, uh, such as Syria, Somalia, Haiti, Haiti and now Ukraine, Diaspora organizations prove their ability to quickly mobilize and release resources, also laying the ground for reconstruction and sustainable development. The transfer of diaspora skills can strengthen and build health, education, justice, and other institutions in a crisis-affected country. And migrants and diaspora members can in turn mobilize other support for rehabilitation of the country of origin. A call to involve non-institutional non actors such as diasporas within broader humanitarian architecture in a more system systematic manner apologies, was launched at the World Humanitarian Summit back in 2016, where the community recognized the role that these actors have historically played. Diasporas have been for long uh, an important partner of IOM's work in both development work but also in responding crisis over the last years an, an increasing number of dedicated initiatives have contributed towards advancing this agenda through capacity building of diasporas promotion of new partnerships and coordination frameworks among these i'll just mention a few such as the frame of a diaspora's engagement in humanitarian systems developed by im washington in cooperation with the haiti uh, renewal alliance the initiative of dmac that works for deeper understanding of diaspora's humanitarian actors and striving for better coordination between the diaspora organizations and the humanitarian system, the tools created by Shabaka, the knowledge sharing encouraged globally within the platform iDiaspora created by IOM, and the work launched the, uh, by the Global Diaspora Confederation. As the humanitarian system have to meet growing complex needs uh, more effectively and to bridge the humanitarian development divide, we hope that this model, designed in a way to be adaptable to other crises and national contexts, can contribute to ongoing efforts to support diaspora in active partner and du uh, during different stages of a crisis. Um, I therefore am uh, glad to uh, now uh, continue and open the, the, the meeting. Um, I would like now to also acknowledge the participation of uh, uh, Director General uh, Tatiana Esposito. Uh, Daniel, Daniel, I will leave now the floor to you. Or I will invite uh, 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 Ms. Esposito to continue uh, uh, the presentations or the introductions. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much, Paula. Yes, now the floor is actually also for Mrs. Esposito, the Director General of the DG uh, on Immigration and Integration Policy at the Ministry of Labor and Social uh, Policies. And we are actually also, uh, I also would like to, come to, to thank her for her presence here, but also for the support along all the, uh, this journey. Um, Mrs. Esposito, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Danielle and Paola. Um, good afternoon, good morning to all the participants. And actually, I want to thank you, to thank IOM for having invited me today to say a few words at the beginning of this webinar. Um, it's very important for us to be here because we have been working hard in recent years on on the issue of diaspora and engagement in line with the indications coming from uh, international and European institutions. I, I would like to mention here the EU action plan on integration and inclusion, but this is also one of the main goals of our Directorate General. And um, this is why for us today's meeting is particularly valuable and we can learn a lot of lessons from this white paper which is launched today. Um, this white paper I would say suggests uh, a model to engage diasporas and I want to stress even before and beyond the humanitarian context. And uh, it allows us to, to understand how to read more in depth and more realistically the needs of the diaspora organizations and also paves the way for a potential systematic dialogue between these organizations and institutions at all levels, national, regional, or even at local level. Um, diaspora organizations are for us uh, an important means of participation, of uh, solidarity, of dialogue, but they're also in many cases fragile, volatile um, subjects. Um, so uh, it's important, first of all, to know knowledge of these realities. So to know um, who they are, what they do, in which field or sectors they're active, it's the first step, I would say, to, for, for any successful engagement uh, pathway. Um, this is why since uh, almost 10 years, since 2014, we regularly map the presence of uh, migrants associations in our country. We have this database, which is publicly available for everyone on our Integration of Migrants portal. And we publish every year annual reports on the main 16 main largest non-EU communities living in our country. But after knowledge, then we need dialogue, a direct di dialogue with these realities, with these subjects. And in this, in this direction, we are running since a few years an initiative called Voice to the Diasporas, uh, which is a series of meetings with representatives of migrants organizations that we are running since a few years. And in the same direction goes also the involvement of um, these associations in the consultative process that we run last year on our new um, uh, programming documents for the 2021-2027 programming period. So we had a direct um, dialogue with these associations on, on our new programming framework for the next years. Um, I would like to conclude that um, in this way, I mean, we have learned a lot of lessons, uh, including from this work with the IOM. Um, and we, I, I think there are a couple of directions that in front of us for, for other work to be done. 
And these two uh, main questions, issues are the issue of representation and the issue of structuring of associations. Uh, and this has to go with the, the reversal of our perspective. So we are used to um, design policies for migrants, but we should learn how to design policies with migrants. And this is what we tried to do in this last exercise of consulting them during the setting and the defining of our programming document. So for this reason, I again um, underlined our great appreciation for the work done in this field and uh, many, many thanks for this path initiated by IOM with the Ukrainian uh, diasporas, which we have immediately supported because it was really close to, to our heart, to, to the way we used to, we used to work. And we firmly believe it represents a model that we can replicate in other contexts and maybe also with other communities. So again, many thanks and uh, good work for, to everyone for this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Esposito. I think it's, uh, uh, it's really an important endeavor actually we have been uh, going through. And I think it's just the starting point because unfortunately, as we can see also from the news these days, uh, crises are always there. And it's important to try to find solutions to be as effective as possible in responding to them. And this was actually one of our starting point in uh, defining why we should involve diasporas uh, during the um, uh, response to a humanitarian crisis. We started in the first place from what are uh, the added, what is the added value of diaspora and what they can actually bring in, uh, uh, in the process. And the first thing that I think it's important to mention is uh, their capacity of, uh, of being uh, uh, usually there over time. So they are not, uh, um, they are not associations or organizations that uh, tend to enter into a crisis because uh, of the emerging needs in that very moment, but because uh, they are um, they are there even before and after uh, a crisis uh, a crisis happens and this is an important added value that should be always um, taken taken into, into consideration uh, now i have I can't uh, uh, have the slide. Uh, of course, I was waiting for the technical problem to come. But anyway, I think this, is what, this was the starting point. And this starting point was, uh, um, was also something that is uh, guiding our work, not only on uh, uh, this emergency response uh, uh, process, but also on other, on other kind of activities. And this comes also into a more, into a broader uh, discussion that is actually happening on how localizing Gate because it is now very clear that because of certain emergencies that we faced in the past, starting from the pandemic, but also others, the role of local actors is really critical and crucial uh, because they have a better understanding of the context most of the time, uh, because they are very, they have very relevant understanding of the situations and the dynamics that they are in. Um, but also because, um, uh, as I was mentioning at the beginning, it's a possibility to keep the uh, the presence in in the long in the long term um so we we are into these uh, flows of uh, of thinking and reasoning but we are also supported by a framework a legal framework in italy that is also very uh, very good which is uh, the uh, the law 125 uh, which is actually a very important law because it is the the one that uh, reframes uh, international cooperation uh, giving a clear role also to diaspora organizations and recognizing their capacity. It is actually because of this law that we have been supported also by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs along these years. And I think also their support was really uh, critical in all these, uh, this process. So because of that, we started in 2020 uh, an initiative to respond to the pandemic. Um, this was done with the diaspora organizations in Italy because of their presence in uh, some, some places, in some areas that were different 
difficult to access for uh, the usual um, for the other players, but also because they had the chance to already activate interest and uh, raise awareness on what was was actually happening also to their countries abroad, so um, to the countries of origin. So this is actually it was a kind of starting point, and through this ex first experience, we launched. Uh, a, an AMICO emergency uh, response. AMICO is a, a national program that we implement since uh, 2010, actually, and uh, there is also a, a, a kind of regranting and subgranting scheme, which we decided to use also for the response of uh, the, uh, the pandemic emergency. Then we continued. Um, when uh, it was uh, um, when there was also the the other emergencies that were coming up, and we started first uh, actually having a better understanding of what was the Afghan uh, the Afghani diaspora doing in Italy to respond to the crisis in Afghanistan. But at the same time, uh, we the community the Afghani community in Italy is not very strong, is not too uh, structured because uh, the numbers are actually increasing now, but at the moment the community is uh, um, is not as um, big as as others like the ukrainian community for instance so when there was the crisis in uh, in ukraine we tried to find a way to um, to involve, to engage the diaspora organizations also uh, in, uh, in this uh, situation so of course the starting points are different on one side you need to have the, the sense of urgency that is given by a humanitarian crisis to have the people coming together. On the other side, you need also to have the presence as simple as that. You need to have a structured, organized um, uh, ecosystem, I would say, of uh, diaspora organizations that are actually already um, intervening in those kind of contexts and are actually already able to provide their support. And then, of course, it's also important to have the kind of uh, framework, the legal framework, or anyway, the conducive framework, a conducive environment that would allow also other actors to come uh, to come together, which was actually what uh, was activated uh, because of the crisis in Ukraine, which was a state of emergency in Italy to ensure that our con the contribution of the country to uh, not only to the country, but also to the people that were coming from Ukraine to Italy was uh, um, was done in the proper, uh, in the most appropriate manner. So uh, at that time, there were also many different uh, uh, coordination meetings that were happening at the same time. So uh, in all those uh, meetings, we realized that uh, there were many stakeholders at the table, that many organizations were actually discussing how to provide support to the Ukrainian community in Italy. But what was actually missing was the voice of uh, the Ukrainians. So we suggested to, uh, to include also uh, the voice and the, represent the representation of uh, diaspora organizations that were coming from uh, from Ukraine. Of course, uh, it was not just a matter of creating a seat or creating a space for this voice to be heard, but also to make sure that this voice was uh, somehow recognized as important as representative from the community as a whole. So we started organizing a number of different online conferences. Uh, we were inviting uh, different organizations that we came um, that we came across in fact we started with what we knew and then we requested them also to indicate and to inform us about other organizations they were aware of so that there was uh, we created we started a kind of snowball effect through which it was possible to have uh, a sort of rapid assessment or a sort of mapping of the diaspora organizations that were present in Italy and we were actually surprised because we are working with diaspora organizations since many years but we didn't know that there were so many Ukrainian diaspora organizations in Italy. And at the end, we, came, we ended up having uh, around 60, um, map, mapping around 60 associations. And out of those 
60 associations, actually 50 replied with interest to this uh, initiative and decided to, uh, to, to, to join uh, forces somehow and also to join those meetings. So the first point was actually the organization of those different conferences. Through those, conference, uh, through those conferences though, we um, managed also to, um, to create the venue and the place for uh, different organizations to come together, coordinate their efforts, and also choose a person, a representative that could actually represent them in those kind of fora I was mentioning before. So we started this initiative. This initiative is uh, built on two different pillars or two blocks. The first one is actually the coordination mechanism through the conferences, the online conferences. And then the second pillar is a sub-granting mechanism that we have developed on the basis of our previous experiences. Uh, the one I was mentioning about Amico Emergency for the response to uh, the, the pandemic. So what were uh, the conferences about? Uh, the first point was really very much about coming together and knowing what everyone was doing in this situation, having a better understanding on uh, where were the different activities, where were what were the different activities, different organizations were implementing, where where were the uh, the areas they were actually operating in, uh, not only in Ukraine but also in Italy, and uh, also to uh, find solutions to, uh, to to logistical problems because there were many, especially at the beginning, but also to come up with a list of needs and priorities that could then be channeled through uh, all those uh, uh, different stakeholders and uh, institutions that were responding to the crisis. Um, the modality of those conferences were online. We had, uh, though, uh, an initial meeting that was only uh, at the national level, and then we continued having uh, meetings at the national levels, but we decided also to have a meeting at the local levels because there were uh, many activities, a lot of action that was happening also at the local level, and the coordination was important to be happening there as well. And we continued on a monthly basis also to have those uh, local and uh, uh, national uh, national meetings. Then uh, each conference, namely each national or local conference, also uh, defined their own terms of reference, defined how they were actually functioning, and decided how to choose or select a spokesperson, someone that could act, that could also that could actually be invited uh, to those coordination meetings, or could uh, could could have a meeting with uh, um, institutions whenever they were uh, requested. And this was actually the case that happened in at the very beginning uh, with the Ministry of Labour, and it was really precious to have their support, but also with other ministries, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and uh, the Department of uh, um, Civil Protection. That was actually the department that was uh, charged with the responsibility of organizing the response to the crisis in, in Italy. And they were actually the ones who got in contact at the beginning very often with uh, the, the spokesperson. And it was very important also to uh, for them to have a better understanding of what were the priorities that the communities, the Ukrainian community in Italy, was uh, giving to them. Um, then, of course, after the, uh, the, the mechanism of the conferences, uh, it's, I think, very important to, uh, to have another practical tool, which is uh, uh, the subgranting mechanism that would allow the associations and organizations to be able to respond to, uh, to the crisis, supporting what they were already doing, in, in fact, because most of them were already implementing activities. Uh, what we launched was a subgranting mechanism for just 8,000 euro per project, and then uh, those, uh, uh, this money could be used to support uh, activities that they were already implementing. This is actually a very important point. Then I guess, uh, uh, I think Roberta will tell you something more about this point, but uh, how it's important not to create new, completely new projects, but actually to start with what is already there and uh, support what is already happening. So we launched a call for proposal. We received uh, a number of uh, uh, 14 uh, different 
different proposals. And out of those 14 proposals, seven were actually funded. And uh, they were uh, operating in a variety of different sectors. As you can see here, it's food transportation and distribution, but also shelter, health, psychological support. And they were covering different regions, different oblasts in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, this was also because of the different uh, areas and regions of origin of the community uh, in, uh, in Italy. Um, out of all this process, I think it's important to mention that uh, 52 associations were actually engaged in, uh, in the entire process, and they are actually now uh, cooperating much more than they were used to. In some cases, many of those associations didn't know each other, in fact. There were five national conferences that were organized and four rounds of local conferences uh, in, uh, in four, in four regions. And then, of course, uh, there is also this white paper, which is is just a, a tool that we think it's important uh, for others also to take into consideration, just starting from our experience. We don't we don't aim to have developed a model that is um, replicable the way it is, uh, just uh, taking and uh, using it somewhere else. It's not a, a, a solution that uh, is not one, one, side fits, one side solution that fits uh, every context. On the contrary, we think that every context has its own specificities. And I think uh, it's important then just to try to get inspiration uh, to these mode, from this model rather than just simply replicate it. And and, and try to see how um, we try to respond to some of the challenges and uh, what were the different uh, experiences that we learned. And actually, the, learn, the learning, I think, is the main outcome, especially, especially for, uh, for us. And there were many things that we would do differently in the future, um, starting from actually spending more time on the preliminary analysis, because this is actually something that we activated just because there was the, the crisis. But it would have been much better if we knew already what the Ukrainian diaspora was already doing, for instance, in terms of uh, providing aid to, to Ukraine, but also to making sure that this conductive and conducive environment and the, the legal framework is uh, is protected in a way and can be there and, uh, and maintained. Uh, also making sure that there is a management of expectations and there are clear objectives between all among all the different stakeholders involved. It's important to spend time and have uh, dedicated human resources because we started uh, thinking that, of course, it was an exercise that was that we were doing because it was important to respond to the uh, to the humanitarian crisis at that time. But then it required a lot of uh, of effort, a lot of uh, a lot of time. And then it's also important to um, making sure that the voices of the diasporas are heard, uh, that there is an efficient communicate an efficient communication, and also appropriate modalities for the sub-granting and training for the diaspora organizations. This is actually another important learning uh, because we started with, with small uh, funding also because we take it, we, we need to take into account also the the, the capacity of implementing uh, those projects, uh, especially at the time where the priorities are completely different. So maybe it's very complicated for the diaspora organizations that is uh, fighting against time also to avail time and energies and resources for a reporting, for uh, developing a project proposal and so on. So um, it's, it's important to uh, adapt those kind of sub-granting mechanism to the context and not try um, to simplify the process as much as possible. Basically, this is very, this is a very, a, a very important lesson that we learned through this process. And then, of course, it's also about making sure that there is a a strong coordination about all humanitarian actors and uh, thinking about new emergencies that might actually come up or thinking about emergencies that are actually happening now, unfortunately. I think what is really important is also to try to make sure that if there is this kind of effort in, in organizing those conferences, this effort is very well coordinated because uh, we were somehow lucky of being the first one in Italy to, uh, to launch uh, the, the idea and 
and um, to have the, the institutional backing from all the different institutions involved. But of course, if there might be situations where you have different um, initiatives coming up at the same time to coordinate uh, different uh, diaspora organizations, then would end up really in, in a struggle. Also because especially the initial, in the initial phase, it was very complicated to, to gain the attention of diaspora organizations because they were very busy doing other things. And then it's also important to think about an exit strategy. So uh, not only about the closing of this, uh, uh, this, um, this phase of the emergency response, but also to what could happen afterwards. Because as I was mentioning at the beginning, one of the added value of the diaspora organizations is in fact their capacity of being there before and after any crisis happens. So thank you very much. And I would leave directly now the floor to Roberta because she would uh, uh, go to the important aspect of this presentation. Roberta, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniele. Um, and thank you very much to IOM Rome uh, and colleagues, um, especially Marina and Marcella and, and all of you for having given me the opportunity to look into this very remarkable uh, case study and experience. And as we said, the hope is really to make uh, the lessons learned from this experience available to all the actors that are uh, wishing to engage diasporas in a more effective way for, um, for better humanitarian assistance. And I think the number of participants here today is a testimony of how this is a very relevant topic. And unfortunately, as you know, a tragedy unfolds in these days in Turkey and Syria, we know how important it is to maintain a multi-stakeholder approach to humanitarian assistance and recovery and bridging toward development in order to provide the best uh, and most effective um, support possible to affected communities. Um, so I, I will take it from where Daniele left. Uh, Daniele gave us an overview of the experience that occurred in Italy last year and is still ongoing. And what we have done here is to, um, is to try to extract some of the best practices and lessons learned from this experience. And then based on this analysis, to come up with a model which we hope can be replicable and adaptable to other contexts and other diaspora communities. And uh, we know already in IOM, there are many missions that are very interested in knowing how the different steps of this um, of this experience were implemented and how it can be tailored to their context. And um, the focus here is on diaspora engagement for humanitarian assistance in country of residence. So you will see the acronym COR here, meaning country of residence, which in this case was Italy, but obviously is applicable to every context and country where there are significant diaspora communities that maintain important ties with their country of origin. But also with sub the subgranting component that has been already introduced is an important financial and capacity building support for boosting diaspora's interventions in their country of origin, in Ukraine in this case, but also other contexts. In terms of methodology, uh, the way in which this um, uh, this white paper was, uh, this model that is uh, described in the white paper was developed is um, through a mixed approach. On one hand, we did a desk review of existing case studies, and uh, there has been a lot, I will say a little bit more about this, but there has been a lot lately over the last, I would say, few years, there has been a lot of development in terms of you know, trying to systematize a bit this engagement in humanitarian assistance and recovery. So there is a lot to learn from other case studies as well. And then we did obviously direct data collection, hearing, hearing from representatives of diaspora organizations that were involved in the initiatives. So a sample of those um, representatives, as well as representatives from the institutional actors that were involved in Italy. Um, next. I don't know if I can move directly or maybe, yes. So uh, the, the suggested model is composed of three macro components. So there is a, there was a preparatory phase and then there is a coordination mechanism and the funding. Um, here I, you will see what Daniel explained is very helpful to understand how these different steps have been, uh, um, have been generalized in a way that can become almost a step-by-step -step, 
um, outline that can be used and followed in the model replication. So for each of these macro components, there are sub components. And obviously the white paper, when you will have the opportunity to read it, goes very much into the details, but here we will give a very general overview. It might sound a bit technical, but I hope that you will be able to pick and choose the aspects of it that are more interesting for your specific work. Next. So the preparatory phase um, has the main aim of setting the stage for the engagement. Uh, and obviously the most, the, 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 the foundational aspect of it is, um, is uh, to define the overall scope of the engagement. And the scope will vary depending on the context, depending on the crisis, depending on the capacities and the needs and the priorities of the diaspora organizations involved. Um, but it's, this is a very foundational stage and the scope needs to be clear, needs to be well communicated to all the stakeholders involved. Um, and obviously, as Daniele was saying, in this specific case, the scope was twofold. On one end, there was the, uh, the, the, the effort to to, in, to foster internal coordination among diaspora organization actors. Some of them were, as Daniela was saying, were not even uh, in contact with one another or their contacts were very sporadic, very ad hoc. So the op was to create a more formalized and structured coordination, but also liaise those diaspora actors with institutional humanitarian actors that were involved or leading the response. And then the, the, the other scope was to provide financial support as a boost for operations on the ground. Um, then another aspect that was mentioned here already is the conducive institutional legal environment. So ideally it would be great to have an existing legal framework that recognizes diasporas as relevant actors in humanitarian and development efforts. And this is, creates a fertile ground for the engagement. And I would say that Italy in this case is really at the forefront of, um, of formalizing this engagement through, uh, through a legal and institutional uh, conducive landscape. And, but obviously this is the, the, the existence of an, of an environment institutionally it's an important prerequisite, but needs to be accompanied by open and regular communication and engagement with diaspora organizations. Ideally, this would happen not only in the implementation phase of the response, but also in the strategic and the decision-making phase. I think uh, the Director General Esposito at the beginning, she was mentioning how you know we really uh, strive to move from working working for migrant community to working with migrant communities and engaging diasporas in the consultation phase is key toward achieving that role. Um, then another important aspect is the definition of the target group and the stakeholders. And this is important because obviously, as we know, uh, working with diaspora communities, diaspora communities are very diverse in uh, in, within themselves internally. And uh, although there is a relevance in terms of um, engaging individual members of the diaspora that can be involved, for example, for, for awareness raising, communication campaign, crowdfunding, fundraising, there is, uh, it, we have seen in this case and also in other cases that engaging diaspora organizations with the certain degree of formalization, so organizations that are already registered, that they have prior experience, in humanitarian response or prior experience in liaising, interfacing with institutional actors, this really uh, benefits the engagement. So those actors are usually the ideal interlocutors. And if they are existing, it would be helpful also to have the possibility to interface with network of diaspora organization, umbrella or coalitions, in order to increase the representativeness of the engagement and then be sure that you know, there is, uh, that these organizations that are engaged are not only speaking on behalf of themselves, but they can represent the larger constituencies. An important tool in this preparatory phase, what Daniele was saying is the mapping. So I will not spend much time here, but as you know, maybe most of us have been involved and also uh, the, the, the Director General Esposito was saying how the, the government itself is conducting in this case, mapping exercises in order to be sure that diaspora communities are known and there is a process of trust building and community building that is created even before the, 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 the crisis hits. Because when the crisis hits, you know, the, the timing is very tense and very tight. So ideally it would be great to create this mutual knowledge and understanding the needs, the capacities, the profiles, uh, the areas of intervention and the priorities of the diasporas beforehand. 
So going to the next phase, the next phase is what is the coordination. So here, coordination can take place in many ways. In the case of Italy, was uh, the choice was um, on uh, was made to have national and local conferences, and uh, I think that there was a very interesting. There is a this is a very interesting, really case study that could be easily replicated in other contexts. Uh, so obviously, even when starting these coordination platforms, it's important to clarify the mandate. And, and this, this definition should be done as much as possible in close consultation with the diaspora actors that are engaged to be sure that the, the engagement is relevant to their own scopes and their own priorities. So during this phase of clarifying the mandate, uh, we obviously we need to look at objectives, timeframes, roles and responsibilities, different modalities and different functions. The, the coordination can, um, can really play different functions. And here, I think we have really looked at um, how a, one single coordination platform can have uh, a multi-layered uh, multi scope. So um, they served as a platform for information sharing, peer-to-peer -peer support, joint advocacy, promotion of collaborative actions, the representation vis-a-vis -vis external actors. I'll say a little bit more about that address concrete operational challenges that were occurring um, in delivering assistance, both in country of origin and in country of residence. Um, and also, as we said here, there was the very interesting um, idea to have two layers of coordination in terms of geographical, geographical representation, one at the national level, one at the local level. And we have heard from the diaspora organizations how these two levels were able to pursue uh, complementary and equally relevant objectives. Um, then there is a very key aspect here, which is the facilitation role, the facilitator role. And um, we have seen in other cases also, in other contexts, how the role of a facilitator in this case played by IOM, which has you know, an independent and neutral, um, and neutral nature, is key for diaspora organizations and also for liaising those organizations to institutional actors. And this role can be interpreted in many ways, depending on the context and the needs. But in, in, each, in each occasion, I think what is important is to balance between the, the importance of having a, a neutral actor that can provide guidance and support and be a kind of catalyst for diaspora's own engagement. And on the other hand, um, you know, allow for diasporas to have the ownership and the control over the process so that they can feel represented and um, express the voice more directly. Um, and also some key features of this role that we've seen IOM play very well in this case are neutrality, credibility, expertise, cultural competency, contextual knowledge, and um, you know, direct and open communication, reliability. So I think this was very much appreciated by the diaspora organizations and can be replicated in other contexts. Here, another important role was the one played by the spokesperson of the diaspora organizations. And obviously, it's clear why this is important is because, you know, in, a, in an engagement that is able to bring together more than 50 diaspora organizations, it's important to have a person that can somehow elevate the different voices and the different needs we, in a joint and coordinated manner. And this is relevant and has been appreciated also by the institutional actors that were interfacing with diaspora organizations so that they could have a single entry point. And uh, this role was also well played in the sense that was able to bridge uh, the local instances, the instances that were collected at the local level, at the regional level, and bring them back within institutional humanitarian forum. Uh, obviously, there are complexities and related to this role, and there are ways, complementary modalities that could be chosen and could be applied. For example, a rotation of this role in order to increase the representativeness, um, and also, for example, as it's been done in other cases, to create within the, the within the broader uh, coordination platform to create working groups that have a specific technical expertise or that focus on different sectors with focal points per sector. This could help also in, in interfacing with institutional actors. Next. Um, so still continuing on the coordination mechanism, I think what we've seen is the modalities that we've discussed, you know, what are the better, what are the best communication channels? You know, we know the diasporas like to use like WhatsApp groups or like other communication channels that are more informal, more personal, direct, like phone calls. 
um, in-person contacts, uh, they also foster trust building. And also the importance of you know, uh, elaborating agenda items within the coordination platforms that are really relevant for the diasporas and that are also able to evolve over time as the situations on the ground evolve, because we know that in humanitarian context, the needs are rapidly changing. Um, but also it's important to balance this evolution also with some key aspects related to the adherence to humanitarian principles, for example, of neutrality, uh, the, I, and a presence of a, a neutral actor like Kayo can help uh, upholding to that to the adherence. Another key aspect that we mentioned is the liaison with, liaison with institutional actors. And I think in this case, really, uh, the way in which this was conducted was quite exemplary. Uh, different actors were involved, both at the national level and the local level, embassies, consulates, civil protection, different line ministries, um, and the, the cooperation agency, and all these actors obviously had different roles and mandates, but it was I think this is something that needs to be considered for also for the follow-up. And, and here brings me to the last point, which is the exit strategy and sustainability. So as we know, sometimes exit strategy and sustainability are afterthoughts, but it's important to consider them since the very beginning and, uh, and try to think about you know, what's the time frame of the engagement, communicate this time frame, and also think about what can happen after um, the role of the facilitator is phasing out, how diaspora communities can actually take over uh, or mainstream some of these uh, engagement efforts within existing institutional platform. For example, the, the Italy has this very interesting um, experience of the diaspora, of the summit of the diasporas, and how, for example, conversations around humanitarian assistance could be included and, and bridging toward development work. I think that would be interesting to see as well. Next. So the, the third phase was the subgranting. Uh, when we did the white, when we wrote the white paper, um, you know, we were in the, the IOM ROM was in the process of selecting and disbursing the subgrants. Uh, but also there are other case studies here, like an interesting, for example, project currently implemented by IOM DC, providing subgrants to diaspora organizations in uh, responding to COVID-19. We just conducted the final conference reviewing at the best practices of that experience. And we see a lot of similarities and complementarities between the experience. For example, definitely the scope is to boost uh, or scale up existing initiatives and somehow leverage what is the diaspora's uh, added value to in a way that is complementary to other actor, to what other actors on the ground are doing. And in, in order to do that, for example, some specific requirements and criteria can help, um, uh, for example, um, ensuring that there is a partnership already existing on the ground, there is adherence to humanitarian principles and standards, and uh, the, the, I think the interesting aspect of the subgrants here is also that there is a twofold objective. On one end is the financial boosting, but also capacity building, training, coaching that can happen at the same time during and before project implementation. And this has been considered very valuable by diaspora organizations that can uh, they, they can see this experience uh, also as a way to further professionalize their own initiatives. Um, and, and then the last point is a promoting coordination with actors on the ground. And this is because we know as when a, when a crisis hits, many actors feel committed and compelled to intervene. Diasporas are very much fueled by a sense of solidarity and they are some of the first responders, but often this can create you know, a chaotic response if, if it's not well coordinated and if there are no at least some uh, possible uh, interfaces that happen between institutional humanitarian actors, government, UN and diaspora actors. So the role of the facilitators can also be helpful in this sense. So now moving forward, uh, there are some just some positive externalities. Uh, by externalities here, we mean some unintended, um, interesting and positive outcomes that were reached uh, and were um, you know, uh, also uh, pursued through this initiative. For example, the transnational coordination with other DOs, uh, this is another level. So we talked about internal coordination, but it's also 
but diasporas are by nature transnational communities. So for example, uh, thanks to the, you know, to the network of IOM country missions, we were able to organize an event in, in cooperation with IOM Ukraine, actually it was led by IOM Ukraine, uh, where some of the diaspora organizations from Italy were able to present and also have this peer-to-peer -peer exchange uh, and, and learning, which was very relevant. And I think that, you know, this always triggers the idea of transnational diaspora communities. And there are also new initiatives happening in this sense, like the Global Diaspora Confederation is, a, is an attempt to bring diasporas from different communities and different countries of residence and origin together. Then there is the importance of mainstreaming the institutional coordination. So obviously an experience like this has an, as a beginning, as an, as an end, although many crises are often protracted, but I think it's important, we think it's important to ensure that some of these institutional and, and coordination liaison that, that have been created during this initiative can be mainstreamed. And I think the, Italy in this um, case is a very interesting example where diasporas are more and more mainstreamed around uh, formal consultative tables, and I think can be really replicated by other actors. We have learned also that engagement in conflict settings is different and is very and is very peculiar vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, engagement in natural disasters. And it carries a number of complexities in terms of neutrality, in terms of independence, of separation between the humanitarian aid and uh, the work of you know, the military. And I think it's important to be aware of those sensitivities and try to navigate them properly. Uh, and I think the role of IOM in this sense is, is helpful because IOM is at the same time a humanitarian actor and also an actor that works very closely with diaspora communities. Um, another aspect is really, you know, if the, if the final scope is to make this, the assistance more effective, I think it's important to always keep in mind complementarity. How do we ensure that fostering diaspora's intervention is done in a way that is really complementary with what local actors, you know, community organizations, governments, international actors are already doing on the ground and there is no overlapping of interventions. And then finally, the localization agenda. Uh, this is an agenda which is very much at the core of the work of, you know, all of us. The overall goal is to increase the, the, the ownership and the control of this process by local communities. And we have seen how the involvement of diasporas that work very closely with local actors, and by doing so, they also uh, contribute toward increasing the capacities and the resilience of local communities. I think this can really help us to advance the localization agenda. Finally, uh, sorry, it's a lot of content. I'm trying to, to be very concise, but finally, we have looked at this within the framework of two important, uh, of, of, of global processes that are taking place. On one end, this is not new. So, as I was saying at the beginning, there are more and more initiatives that are happening, both uh, led by IOM, led by other actors like our, our colleagues at the MAC, for example, they are based in Denmark. In a, and, the, in, and there is an, an effort, a global effort to bring forward uh, what uh, Paola was saying at the beginning, beginning, the commitments that were made during the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016 and really operationalize, operationalize them um, by applying diaspora's engagement in different contexts. So an important initiative in this sense is the framework for diaspora engagement humanitarian assistance that was um, created a couple of years ago and has been implemented and piloted ever since by IOMDC, but you know, with a with a global perspective, and it's been piloted so and in cooperation with the Haiti Renewal Alliance, and it's been piloted so far in Haiti and Philippines. But there are opportunities for, for piloting every day, like in every new crisis. I think we should we should approach the crisis with a more for with a more structured approach. Um, and then uh, you know. Why, why this model, how this model fits within this global framework. This model uh, that is drawn by the case study in Italy fits in this global framework in a way that kind of um, supports an element and a component that was a bit underlooked. Uh, and, and that's the, the one of diaspora engagement in country of residence. So in this case, Italy, 
to support diaspora's intervention, both in country of residence, so for the integration and the, and the welcoming of refugees, but also in country of origin. And um, I, we're really excited really for this experience to fit and complement within the global framework. And then the last thing I will say is about some links between this model and the humanitarian development peace nexus, um, which I think is really at the core of, of, this, uh, of this initiative. And, uh, Definitely something that is obvious and everybody is aware of, diaspora, con diaspora's efforts are continuous over time. They don't, they are not limited by mandate, you know, humanitarian versus development. Diaspora's commitment is doesn't have a project time frame and a cycle. So I think by leveraging this, by leveraging this continuity of, of effort, we can more organically uh, in, promote programs that go from the response to the recovery and bridging toward development. And also this, you know, by applying, for example, subgranting, by working on subgranting, we could try to identify and um, give priorities to some interventions that are able to meet shorter term needs while at the same at the same time maintaining a developmental lens. We know that development is a lens that can be applied at all phases of the humanitarian response. Uh, and then also last but not least is to encourage partnership with local actors and, 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 and streamlining the coordination in order to ensure longevity and sustainability of the intervention. There is more in the white paper around the nexus, but you know these are just some macro areas. Some conclusions here, I think we all realize that unfortunately, no, I mean, unfortunately the, the magnitude of crisis show us that there is need for a multi-stakeholder approach and diasporas are key actors and we need to keep uh, really investing in this, in this engagement. This is a remarkable case study. I have worked with this, uh, you know, in this area over the last five years, and I've really am impressed about what IOM Rome has been able to do in these case studies and also in previous engagement efforts. So there is a lot to learn and, and a lot of like cross fertilization to, to promote. Um, the white paper will be soon available in English and Italian, and uh, hopefully you will all receive the link, we'll be able to engage more, and we will remain available for also bilateral engagement. Thank you for your attention. I'll hand over the floor to Daniele. Thank you very much, Roberta, and thank you very much for the presentation. Yes, there were many things to say, so I guess the time we were being too optimistic in uh, thinking that one hour was enough to say everything that we wanted to say. But now is also the time for possible questions, if you have any. Uh, there is one that is already in the, in the chat. Um, is about where we can see this map. I guess uh, it's also what where we can see the white paper. The white paper is going to be available, as uh, uh, Roberta was mentioning, very soon. We are just uh, in the final steps for the publication, and it will be uh, available on our website. But also, we will try to um, to share the link with uh, with all your contacts. And then, of course, uh, about how in case of diaspora organizations from Ukraine uh, present in Italia, how to get in contact with us, we will put on our on the chat also our uh, email address. And of course, uh, please write to us so that you uh, would be uh, sure to be in uh, in uh, uh, in our list. And, uh, and we can actually also consider you for other uh, conferences or for other initiatives. Um, if you have uh, questions, uh, um, please just uh, raise your hand and then we will unmute you. Or again, you can write on the chat. Okay. Ah, okay. Um, if, yes, please, Daria. Uh... Yes, hello. Yes, uh, my name is Dara from DMAC, as I already said. I just have, have a question. Thank you, first of all, thank you very much for this presentation. It's really remarkable work you did. Um, and uh, do you plan to replicate this in general, I am to replicate this experience in other countries? Not only in Italy. In other countries other than Italy, you mean? Yes, yes. Uh, well, actually, one then I would leave also to Roberta to to answer on that because she has a better uh, overview oh, yeah, on, yeah. On, on these kind of aspects. But from our uh, point of view, of course, we would like also to um, 
this uh, this model to be used or replicated or just uh, get and 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 adapt it to other countries as well. Roberta, I leave it to you. Now, thank you, Daria. It's nice to have you here. And um, so, yes, replicability is exactly what we are aiming at. And replicability can happen on many levels. On one hand, you know, the same country of residents, like Italy in this case, can replicate the same model with other communities when other you know disaster strike unfortunately or even in the recovery phase in and 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 you know and and bridging for the for the development as we were saying but also other country of residents should be able to use this model and adapt it and tailor it to their own context like for example this morning i was in touch with colleagues in brussels as ioan belgium is now trying to is trying to engage the Turkish diaspora and 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 work together to you know, you know, in the face of this uh, of of this massive uh, tragedy that has hit the country. So obviously, you know, there are many cases in which um, this same type of engagement process will need will be relevant and will need to take place. And our hope here is to make it easier for new actors. To, to, to embark in this engagement by having already some lessons learned and some steps. And actually, another important element here to mention is that IOM and the MAC plan to work very closely also to, to be sure that we learn, you know, we kind of maximize our own networks, our own capacities for, a, for better serving diaspora communities. So doing it not in a replication or in overlapping of each other, but do it, doing it in, in cooperation. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. And thank you very much, Daria, for the question. Any other uh, question? Martin Russell. Uh, yes, uh, fascinating presentation. In closing, you mentioned the need to continue investment in diaspora humanitarian, humanitarianism. Based on the white paper, what do you think is the next most strategic investment to be made by donors to progress, elevate the prominence of diaspora organizations in humanitarianism? Thanks. Roberta, this is for you. Daniele, feel free to jump in. This is a, this is a, this is a tough question, obviously, Martin. Thank you for being here with us. I, I was not, I wouldn't expect any less from you. Um, so this is open. I think this is open to, to, to brainstorming and to creative approach. Um, I definitely the sub granting model. This is something we are looking into and we have seen how What's the what's the impact? The, I think the return on investment for diaspora organizations in terms of sub grants is very high. Even little seed money can go a long way in terms of scaling up and in terms of boosting diaspora's intervention. And we are planning to collect, you know, experiences from not only from Italy but from other contexts to kind of. Uh, to build up more evidence. So I think that that personally, I believe that's a model that should continue. But in a way that, as I said, shouldn't be, shouldn't treat diaspora as, you know, traditional NGOs, but really boosting existing initiative, ensuring that this is done in a way that foster local actors, engagement and capacities, uh, and also like really building on the added value of the diaspora's intervention. So there are there are some criteria there to take into account. There might be other financial efforts and financial um, investment modalities. For example, a traditional one, which I think has been used in the past and maybe can be replicated again, is the matching, you know, like diaspora's intervention, diaspora's can bring their own financial uh, contributions matched by, for example, government and by donors in a way that can scale up the initiatives. Um, and, and there are also some private, private uh, some, some modalities that involve private actors. For example, in the Philippines, what we are doing in the recovery phase, that doesn't work very much in the emergency phase, but in the recovery, we are working with microcredit institutions to allow uh, vulnerable communities that are trying to rebuild after a typh after typhoons um, to, to use microloans for their reconstruction. And diaspora's remittances are playing the role of guarantees against these microloans at, for communities and members that otherwise would not be considered eligible for this type of financial tool. So these are just three quick examples, but 
just to conclude this, we are planning uh, in April to have a side event at the Humanitarian Networking and Partnership Week in Geneva, organized by, organized by OCHA and other humanitarian actors, exactly to look into alternative financing to invest in diaspora's intervention, um, including the subgranting. So hopefully, if you can join us there, we will discuss more and hopefully come up with other innovative ideas. Over. Thank you very much, Roberta. If I can add also on this, because I think it's important, of course, uh, to provide investment that are financial investments, but looking it at the perspective of a country of destination, I think it's also important for these, the institutions to invest their time and their energy also to create this kind of legal framework or at least a conducive environment for all the diaspora organizations and the diaspora communities to be heard, because in those phases, I think they can make the difference. Uh, I don't know if there are other questions. So I would like really to thank you all very much for being here today. And of course, uh, yes, Svitlana, one more question. How is the voice of Ukrainian refugees who have been in Italy for only one year included into this exercise? Well, um, Yes, uh, as I was mentioning, actually, it would be important for all uh, diaspora organizations that uh, didn't take part of the process, because, of course, we started working with uh, the organizations that, as I mentioned, we knew or that were present or uh, operational already. But for all the others, it would be really be important that you please get in contact with us. For us, it would be impossible to understand and to map out all the organizations that are there. But uh, if you reach to us, it would be uh, for sure we will include you in all uh, in all our uh, lease or next uh, initiatives and thank you very much and there is also another question by dmitro please the floor is yours yeah hello everybody i would like to ask is it possible to have um, an exchange uh, an exchange with experience with other uh, diaspora in other countries. Uh, we are from Italy and we, uh, we would like to um, have a possibility to create uh, um, official uh, institutional rep uh, representative of Ukrainian diaspora, diaspora in Italy. And it would be really helpful to have this kind of exchange and also maybe so, sort of documents to how to build our representation in Italy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mitro. Yes, I think having an exchange with other communities is also something Roberta is working on. So maybe you can answer to that, Roberta. Okay. Hi, Dimitro. Thank you so much. I think uh, there was one event that happened where that was led by IOM Ukraine, and um, there was an attempt to bring together diaspora, Ukrainian diaspora organizations from different countries of residence. There were representatives from US, Canada, Italy, other European countries as well. Definitely, I think would be helpful to replicate um, because it was very well attended, was very appreciated and helpful. So I think we could work uh, closely with colleagues in IOM Ukraine or other, other country of residence um, and, and see whether we can replicate this exchange at the transnational level. Uh, there have been also, if you, there is the Global Diaspora Confederation, if you can, uh, if you are able to check their website, they have been having consultations on a regular basis, focusing on the Ukrainian crisis. I think the last one was a few months ago, but there might be the interest and the need to organize another one in order to foster this peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Um, and I, and I then eventually, you know, it's also up to the organizations to to create formalized networks, alliances, coalitions. An interesting example for, is uh, from the Syrian diaspora. Unfortunately, the Syrian diaspora has been dealing with a decade of conflict and currently also uh, affected by this current earthquake. And they have created transnational coalitions uh, in order to ensure that this engagement is not just ad hoc, but takes place in a more regular structured way. So this could be also an interesting case study to learn from. And we could put you in touch with colleagues from the Syrian diaspora. They are very generous in sharing their experience. 
Uh, thank you very much, Roberta. And actually, uh, Larissa, Larissa Lara from Geneva, she's also sharing a few other uh, links that I think are also very, very useful on the on the chat. Then I see uh, that Tatiana Esposito raised her hand. Please, Tatiana, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Daniela. I would like to provide um, some some information, uh, trying to to offer um, an example to Mitro who asked for um, examples of uh, um, building a formal representation of diaspora. We have been running uh, an experience at the Ministry of Labor in the last years um, addressed to um, young people with a migrant background, the so-called second generation of migrants. And we accompanied them through uh, a process of formalizing a representation of uh, um, young people of second generation. So we um, supported them with a capacity building um, uh, intervention together with IOM, IOM once again. Uh, we supported them in um, building and formalizing this uh, umbrella association of associations of young people of, with a migrant background coming from more than 40 uh, countries around the world and living in Italy. So this could represent an example for uh, this process of formalizing uh, a representation and this um, umbrella Association now sits in formal tables and that has, has a dialogue with institutions and uh, can have hard access to uh, financing from uh, European, national, even local, uh, local institutional actors. So we could offer these as an example. And uh, you can find more information on this experience, which is called CONGI, Coordinamento Nazionale of the New Italian Generations, on our portal, on the Integration of Migrants portal. Thank you very much. Yes, um, thank you very much because this is actually a, a great a experience and a great example on how it is possible to build representation also from different diaspora organizations or in this case, organizations that have a multicultural background. There is also just to fi finish also on this uh, mentioning, there is also another ex example, which is the, uh, the, the so um, uh, called the National Diaspora Forum, that is actually a project that is going to um, create the, the, a forum for diaspora organizations in Italy. In that case, and this is also common to, uh, to the CONGI experience, all diaspora organizations are coming from all different countries of affiliation or of, or of origin. So we do not have many experiences of a formalized representation of diaspora organizations that are coming from one community only. Uh, and actually this is also something that somehow we have been encouraging um, also through our, through our work uh, to make sure that the different diasporas can create platform and fora for their joint representation rather than representation presentation divided by uh, communities that sometimes are already very difficult to bring together. So thank you very much. And now the time is really up, but thank you very much for uh, all your, uh, for the presence and for staying here until the end, but also for all your comments, suggestions, and questions. Um, stay in touch, really, uh, just for, uh, to, to look to our website and to see uh, when we are going to launch new initiatives and especially for the white paper to be launched, to be um, shared soon. Today was the launching because we were are very impatient to launch the white paper, even uh, if the link is coming is coming soon, and um, uh, and also for other new initiatives, but even for other questions or for just uh, uh, no better what we are doing. Thank you very much, and uh, have a nice afternoon or the rest of the day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.